there will be times when I am called out um, and I need to pay attention to it, right? Like there will be a time or there are times where a black person is saying, no, you need to sit down. And I might be like, no, I don't want to sit down, but maybe I really do need to sit down. And then there are going to be times when um, a person is saying, you know, no, you need to sit down. And I might have to say, no, I think in this particular case, I really do need to speak up and here's why, right? Like, but it's a constant self-check that that's not coming out of my ego, that, that it has to be coming out of my divine calling, right? Not, not the ego. Welcome back to the Balance Bowley podcast for ambitious women in business and a few brave men. I'm your host, Nikita Thigpen, balance and relationship advisor, partnering with you so we can amplify intimacy within and across your relationships, and you can have the freedom, confidence, and flexibility to thrive in work life and in love. Here we are. We are towards the end of season 20. Bold decisions and big rewards. What does that look like for you? For all of you who have been following the Balance Bully podcast, you've been listening to this whole entire season and hopefully prior to this when we talked about love, sex, marriage, babies, divorces, and everything in between. And now we're talking about those really bold decisions that you had to make or you want to make so that you can reap the bigger rewards. That means we got to get uncomfortable. You've been hearing that kind of mantra, that theme, that metaphor for multiple years at this point, especially for many of you who are high executive leaders and entrepreneurs. You are in the space where comfort is not where your creativity shines and comfort is not where all of the blessings come from, not only for yourself, but for those you impact the most. So what are those bold decisions that you've been sitting on, questioning, wondering about, thinking about, maybe too afraid to move on because you don't feel like maybe you have the support, accountability, the advisors or team you need, or maybe because you're just too much in your head. We all get monkey brain. We all get that moment when we just feel like, well, I don't know, I, I keep having the same questions and I keep getting the same answers. It's probably because you are asking them to yourself in isolation, which is never a good thing. Or you are asking a circle of people who are giving you answers based on their own fear and they are projecting them on you. So they love you. They want you to be great, but they are afraid that you will fail in the same way that they, they have failed or they were afraid that they would, you know, that you would fall because of what they're scared of, basically. So be very, very mindful of that. Be mindful of who is speaking into your ear gate what you are watching, seeing, absorbing, and feeling because those things matter and whether or not you're going to have the energy and the boldness to make the next step in your life that could change everything. Which is why I am so grateful and so honored to have this beautiful spirit, this amazing woman, this woman who has done more than walk her talk. I was trying to convince her to be on a later season when we really like get into like fully living the life you teach because that's all she's about. That is absolutely every single thing that she's doing. I have to welcome you all. Everyone who doesn't know anything about her, you, you're, you're going to learn today, as Kevin Hart would say. You are going to learn today. Carrie Connolly, a writer, a mystic, a coach, a leader, a sister, a friend, a mama. She is an amazing woman and happens to be the author of a very pivotal and provocative book that could not be more timely. The author of The Good White Racist. You may not understand what that means, but you're going to learn today. Carrie, welcome to the Balance Bully Podcast. Thank you so much. Wow, you are amazing. Your energy is so contagious. It's like I just want to get wrapped up in it. It's, it's so <laughs> awesome. Thank you. What an amazing introduction. I'm so glad to be here. I am super excited to have you. And I would love for you to just share with everyone what you're doing in the world and what led you to put your heart, soul, and pain in mm. this book. Mm. So, you know, um, I think just as, as a white woman writing about uh, racism and anti-racism and really about whiteness is, is really what I, I try to focus on. Um, my own racial awakening has been a long time coming. It's, you know, a lot of different milestones um, throughout the years, but the, the most pivotal I think was, was being in seminary 
um, and being exposed to uh, to liberation theologies and womanism, uh, womanist theologies, and um, and then having one of the most life changing moments or two. It was a two part moment, to be honest. <laughs> it was. It was um, the the first was being assigned in uh, in one of my classes uh, to watch an episode of On Being with that uh, where Krista Tippett interviewed Ruby Sales. Um, and for those of you who don't know who Ruby Sales is, she is a public theologian, a womanist uh, public theologian and an activist. And she was in about 17 years old, um, standing on a porch with some other uh, friends of hers who were active in the civil rights movement. And a white man walked up to them and with a shotgun and he pulled the trigger and the bullet was aiming directly for Ruby Sales, and a white seminarian jumped in front of her, a young mm -hmm. man jumped in front of her and took that bullet and died immediately. And that changed the course of Ruby's life. And so she told the story on this episode of On Being, and she was just talking about, um, she said, you know, I, I know that we have a, a Black liberating theology. Where's the white liberating theology? Where's the, the theology that liberates white people from meth addiction and from hunger and from poverty and all of these things. And it was, I was so struck by the generosity of that statement of, as, as a black woman saying, where's the white liberating theology. Right. And, uh, and then the idea that white people need to be liberated from something, huh? Come on. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Right. Mm -hmm. And I couldn't get that out of my head. Right. And, and, um, and I said, well, what, what else do seminarians do, but think about theology and drink wine. So why not, <laughs> why not me? And why not start thinking about that? Um, and so I did, but, but really what this book ended up being was my, my pre-education. I'm just now starting to work on, on actually, working toward a white liberating theology, but this book was necessary for my, my own education about what whiteness is. Yeah. The second part of that moment was that about, I think it was the next semester, I actually got to meet Ruby Sales and literally sit at her feet wow. uh, at Middle Church in New York City. And she took my hand in hers and held it on, on her lap. And she stared into my eyes and I will never forget her eyes are, are just fierce. They're so fierce. And she stared into my eyes and she said, white supremacy is soul murder. It is murdering the souls of white people. It is flattening and homogenizing you and, and stealing your, your le legacies and your heritage and your lineages. And, and it, is, it is murdering the souls of white people. Mm. And it was just such a, an incredibly powerful moment that that's what I, why I went home and started the White on White podcast where I attempted uh, and still attempt occasionally to deconstruct white identity. Um, and ultimately, that's what led to the book. That is incredible on so many layers of mm -hmm. for the history moment that we just all got, because I know <laughs> this is the first that I'm hearing about the depth of that. Mm -hmm. um, I think I heard about it in pieces and not quite as articulate as mm -hmm. you said it. So thank you for that, Carrie. Mm -hmm. um, but more importantly, something that you said towards the second part of that kind of um, opening your eyes, like really like going from the sleepy to a little bit more, you know, I guess I'll use the young people phrase woke, you know, mm -hmm, the woke mm -hmm, phase mm -hmm. of that was her pouring into your soul, the relatability of us all, us humans, of us all being people who deserve to be here, right? Yes, like yes. this is this supremacy, this issue, these chop these historical challenges are not just affecting me as a black woman, her as a black woman and, and all those that came before her and came after her, but also you. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people won't necessarily embrace that because they think it's a hot like, oh woe is woe is you, right? Mm -hmm. Like, oh here you guys go complaining again. Here's mm -hmm. your your challenges. Just get a job. Just pull yourself up from the bootstrap. Just, mm -hmm. you know, like whatever the language is that they want to convince themselves is okay. Mm -hmm. um, and she was saying, like, we're sisters. Mm -hmm. And I want to see your legacy. Mm -hmm. I want to make sure that you can be here and be impactful and grow and be loved on and be here to love mm -hmm. and not be caught up in what is just expected and normal because normal is not necessary. Mm -hmm. Yeah. She's womanist to the core, man. Like, I mean, that is the, the, at the truest to my, to the best of my understanding of womanism, which for those who don't know, it's, it's essentially black 
I, I hate to say it's black feminism because it's really not. Then that centers feminism and white feminism. Right. But but it is um it is a a black woman's theology. Um, so as a white woman, I can't claim womanism. Right. Um, I aspire to it. I I am, am informed by it. And listen, if a if a black womanist wants to call me a womanist, I will take the compliment. <laughs> but I I do not claim it for myself. Um, but it's so it's such a beautiful, rich um, ideology and theology because because of what you're saying that it recognizes the humanity in all people. And what I love most about it is that it says, you know, it says, I'm going to love everybody on this earth, including me, including yeah. myself, right? Like, so it's, so it's this, it's this beautiful image of black women demanding um, and insisting upon their worthiness, their, their self-worth and their inherent value. Um, and I think, I can't think of anything holier than that. Or more sober than that. It's no. beautiful. A thousand percent agree. So I have to ask you, Carrie, like what was your bold decision that broke you through to accepting this new path that mm. you were awakened to? Yeah. So I, th you know, th there's one in particular that I will, I will point to, but I also want to make it clear that I think it's also that one bold decision wasn't the only thing. It's a lot of small, bold decisions. It's That's a right. lot of tiny little bold decisions um, sometimes it's, it's the tiny bold decision to write about something that might have felt really uncomfortable, right? It might've been, um, a bold decision to, um, to believe in myself on a day when I, or to talk to somebody or to go to a networking event or to do something that, um, was a little bit outside of my comfort zone. I know I will say that one of those smaller, bold decisions that I would make repetitively. And every time I did, it was, I was, I experienced exponential growth every single time was um, I would have to look around and I'm sure you can, you can, you're down with this. I'm sure is that mm -hmm. every once in a while I would look around and I would go, and, and I'm sorry if this sounds like really conceited, I, I don't mean to sound that way, but I would look around and be like, Hmm, like right now I'm, I'm the leader. I'm mm -hmm. in charge. I'm, mm -hmm. I'm the smartest person in the room right now. And everybody's coming to me and that's not good for my growth. That's right. Right. And, and I think that smart women need to recognize because it feels good. It feels good to be the smartest person in the room. Um, but it's not good for, you're going to get stuck. So if you're feeling stuck, look around and see if you're the smartest person in the room. And if you are, then go and be intentionally in spaces where you feel like you're the dumbest person in the room, where mm -hmm. you are the most intimidated. Every single time I've ever done that, every single time I have grown exponentially. I've grown my network exponentially. I've grown my expertise, my uh, potential, my income every single time. Um, so that's, that's, and, and those are small decisions, right? That's a small decision to just walk into a room that you might not feel, yeah. that might might make you gleam as Mary Kay as she said, right? <laughs> might, might make you a little sweaty, right? Um, so I think that that's, that's one of those small, quiet decisions that you can make on a regular basis. Um, but the big decision that I made was I was on staff at um, an evangelical church for about five or six years, I think. Um, and I was writing, I had, I had made a decision to lean into writing and, and writing is, the, you know, um, a thing that you have to do a lot of for free um, uh -huh. before you ever see a paycheck for it. And when you do see a paycheck, it's not going to be a big one. Uh -huh. um, but, you know, I, I decided to, to kind of say, screw it. I'm just going to go ahead and I'm going to write, I'm going to write what I think. And then one day I was sitting here and I made a small, bold decision to pitch my blog to Pathios, which is a large platform. And I, it got accepted. Awesome. Um, and then I started blogging there, but part of what happened was I did start writing about issues that, um, were considered controversial in the church. Things like, uh, things that would be called divisive, like yeah. LGBTQ rights mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. women's rights mm -hmm. and, uh, racial issues. And mm -hmm. I literally got called into the, the pastor's office and told to stop writing about those things, because as a staff member, I could not be cons considered writing about things that were quote divisive. Cause you know, justice is a really highly divisive thing. Mm. You know, recognizing the inherent humanity of all people, totally divisive. <laughs> I love your sarcasm. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
I'm from Jersey, man. I can't help it. <laughs> um, so like, so for a while, because I was afraid and I wanted to keep my job, I, I, I stayed silent and mm -hmm. um, it felt horrible. It felt horrible. Yeah. And um, finally, I I got to a point where I was like, uh -uh, I'm not doing this anymore. And mm -hmm. I finally I walked in and I um, there were it was death by a million cuts. I'll be I'll be honest. But yeah. a big primary thing was I said, I don't want anybody to be able to tell me what I can and cannot say ever again. Um, and and that's also why I'm an entrepreneur and why I'm a coach and why I coach other women to to make these kinds of changes, because um I know. And the day that I realized that I needed to be an entrepreneur was a sad day because um, it's so much easier to just be able to collect a paycheck and but know that that is. paycheck is going to be there. Right. It's so mm -hmm. much. But when I realized that that would make like be like sucking my soul out my left nostril there and that I would never really be happy doing that. Um, it was kind of a sad day because I knew that I was going to have to dig deep for every inch of courage that I had, you know, all the time. And, yeah. um, and I was going to have to really believe in myself and trust myself in ways that I had never done before, you know, yeah. uncomfortable, that, super uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. And so, and, but, but it was one of the best things that I ever did because, um, I mean, literally I started writing on Pathios. I started writing whatever the heck I wanted to write. Yep. And nobody could tell me otherwise. And that's what got, you know, I had my publisher came to me and invited me to submit a book proposal. I mean, that's that does awesome. not happen, right? Like that's a that's writer's not. dream, you know, mm -hmm. like to be invited by a publisher to submit mm -hmm. a book proposal when most people struggle just to get their book propos proposals read, right? Yeah, and exactly. That was a huge thing. And it never would have happened if I hadn't made those series of small, bold moves and then bigger, bold moves. And, and they all, they are all threads because I will tell you that the, the, one of those bold moves that I made in that was to be the dumbest person in the room mm -hmm. led me to meet a woman um, who ran a networking group. Her name is Angela Kim. She's the founder of Saver Beauty. Yeah, we know Angela. Uh, She's amazing. It. Angela's amazing. And Angela is a pitch master. And I learned how to pitch from Angela. Mm -hmm. And so that's what helped me pitch to Pathios, which is what helped me be where I am, right? So it's it's this beautiful, divine, mystical strand of decisions and events um, that have led me to where I am. So. Yeah, I mean, faith without works, right? Like yeah. you had to make that bold decision to believe that there was something more for you yes. than just submitting to a man or woman or people, yes, humans who wanted yeah. to block the opportunity of freedom yes. to for other people to have their minds freed, right? Yeah. Yeah. And there was something in you beyond the yucky, uh, icky, tricky, sticky feeling that you had when they kind of quelched your fire and told you to stop writing there was something between that moment and the moment that made you say not anymore mm -hmm. this, i will not go down in history as that person who started the fire but then walked away and said oh well you know mm -hmm. i i can't continue to contribute to it and help contain it a little bit right mm -hmm. like to make sure that mm -hmm. people who shouldn't get burnt get burnt because they tried to, to quelch you all together and there was something in that that you said, no, um, I'm just going to risk it. I'm going to risk it all. I'm going to do this. Maybe not get paid for it, right? Yep, like, yep. we do know writers, sometimes you receive a check that covers a stack of paper. Like exactly. <laughs> Exactly. The paper you just used to print, the, you can replace that that ink cartridge, maybe. Exactly. <laughs> cool. I can go to Michael's and get a new $5 journal. Exactly. <laughs> I don't know how I know that life. Yes, yes, yes. Um, and be so excited about it at the same time. Um, and you wanted more and you released mm -hmm. yourself because you did the work. You didn't just sit in a space of believing in the possibility of it. Yes. You worked for it and you took the bumps and bruises to your point, the death by a million cuts, like you were being sliced up in lots of ways. And I know from our personal conversations that you had a lot of people coming at your neck about mm. you know, being a white woman who was saying like, yeah, we're racist. There, mm -hmm. there are some things that we got to change and we got to change quickly. And there's a lot of good we can do in the process. Mm -hmm. And people didn't vibe with that between your, the Twitter attacks and mm -hmm. oh my God, like, 
to tell your story, but you know oh, what I mean? Like, I would yeah. love for you to share some of how you were able to handle those moments. I mean, you, you know, you have a life, you're human, you're, you know, you get cut, you feel that pain like anyone else. How were you able to push through even when you were constantly being punched? Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Yeah. And it does feel like I'm constantly being punched. That's a very accurate decision, uh, description, especially because as a white woman in anti-racist -race, uh, spaces, and and I think the biggest thing that I learned in in writing the book, and as I really tried to 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 struggle with this tangled mess that is racism, is systemic racism, and it is a tangled mess, right? I mean, it's tang, it's it's all tangled up with patriarchy, with capitalism, with, um, with interpersonal relationships, with, you know, our own psyches, um, what, what our own self-image, like all of these things that are so, um, very messy and very human. And, mm -hmm. and the thing is, is that we love binaries, right? As human beings, we love, we love things to be very clear. It's one thing or the other. And very often in this case, it's not, it's, it's always, it's very often contextual and it's an, and this, it's a, it's a, this, and it's also this, right? So it's, it's a very, very messy thing. And, and one of the ways that that is manifested is as a white woman, I am somebody who understands, for example, what a microaggression feels like because mm -hmm. I have experienced them um, from men, right? right. Because I'm one step away from the top of the hierarchy, right? Mm -hmm. So I'm not quite all the way there, but I have my, my embodiment holds a lot of privilege and a lot of power. Um, but not all of the privilege and not all of the power. So right. I am able to stand in this place of where I can look up, and I hate to say that, but yeah. on the hierarchy, right? And I can see how, um, I can understand so much about how white men don't get it and have all these blind spots, but I can also see, point to how they dehumanize me and how they oppress me, Right. Um, and then I can look at my my siblings um, from the BIPOC community, and I can recognize that I can never understand their mm -hmm. experience. And yet, there's something that I can point to, and I can go, "Yeah, I know what am I how exhausting microaggressions are. I don't understand fully the way you experience them, but I do know that feeling. So I can I can kind of." T speak to that a little bit and understand why it's important and what it is. Right. And so I, I am in this, this boundary land where mm. I can speak to white men and, and help them understand and even other white women and help them understand. Right. But also what that means is that there, I have, listen, I'm, I'm in deep relationship with black, my best friend, we share a tattoo. Okay. Mm -hmm. We just went on vacation. She's black. We are in deep, deep relation. I'm in deep relationship with many black people. Um, and the the thing that I have learned is that, you know, so many black people are, they get me, they understand where I'm at. And there are other black people that are like white people just can't do this work. Mm -hmm. White, they, mm -hmm. they really think that white people have no place in anti-racist spaces. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And as somebody, for me, as somebody who's sitting here going, hey, listen, white people, we need to listen to Black voices. We need to learn from Black voices and we need to submit to Black voices. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'm sitting here going, okay, well, which Black voice do I listen to? Do I right. listen to my friends who are going, no, we need you? Do, do I listen to even the people online who are saying, no, we need you? We need you doing this work? Or do I listen to the Black voices who say, it's time for you to take a seat? Right. And then where's my, where's my space there. Right. And so I had to really carve that out for myself. I had to f figure that out. And the thing that I figured out is, again, it's always going to be contextual. There are times when I need to sit down and shut up. Mm -hmm. That's, there are going to be times when I need to do that, where it is not about me and my voice. Right. And um, the best way that I can be an ally and care for my siblings of color is for me to be quiet and just have their back if they want, if they need me. Right. And then there are going to be times when it's time for me to use my voice and, to, and to put my body in between um, police and uh, my black and brown siblings, or to use my body um, as, as a shield or something, right. Mm -hmm. there's, there's going to be times where I'm going to have to do that. And then what I realized as I really prayed about this and sought divine counsel on it 
is I realized that whiteness is very much like an addiction. And so as we begin to, to deconstruct our white identities, white people need companions mm. uh, who have already gone down this path of deconstructing our whiteness because it is a grieving process. You, you, you end up going to a really dark place, right? Yeah. A really deep, deep midnight of the soul because you're sitting here going, wow, everything that I thought about myself is is based on this construct. Um, and it's so overwhelming. It's so overwhelming to recognize my own complicity. And now that I, I'm aware of it, I want to do something about it, especially white women, because we really have this thing that we're, we need to be perfect and fix right. everything. And so one, when, when we realize that we're not going to be able to fix everything with like a glass of wine and a bubble bath, it, <laughs> crap, what, what am I going to do? Like what I feel helpless and and powerless. And so, and we have to move through that into this place of real lament, um, which will get us to repentance, right? Which, and lament is, in my opinion, lament is the public, um, the the public grief and mourning that we exhibit, um, which I think we've seen some of it's been performative. Some of it has been authentic over the past few months. Um, The distinction. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, Mm -hmm. But I think we've started to see that, that, public lament, and then it needs to move us into rep- uh, recon- uh, no, not reconciliation, reparations and repentance, which, and repentance requires reparations in my, mm-hmm. my opinion, which is the active dismantling of, of racist systems, which has to include uh, financial reparations. A thousand percent. I mean, we've seen some of the actual non-performance, but public activism of exactly what you said and with the Portland moms, mm-hmm. right? That yes. are being gassed yes. as they, they use their bodies to your yes. point, to lock arms and stand in front of their siblings that are BIPOC um, and really say no more, this mm-hmm. is not happening. And that is clearly not a performance, right? Correct. Like they Correct. are- Politicians uh, kneeling with Kente cloths, that's a performance. Exactly, exactly. Yes. So I love that you distinguish that. Um, and I appreciate the transparency and- the humility in saying that you're part of your walkthrough of identifying not only your voice, but your lane, your space and your place in a fight that you didn't necessarily want, but you were pulled forth into Mm -hmm. because it is a part of your legacy. It is bigger than you, Mm -hmm. which makes it more divine, which also keeps you grounded in a, not about me, but Mm -hmm. more about what my power is meant for, you know, yeah. like all of us have power, use it for good, use it for evil, it's your choice, right? That is free will at yes. the end of the day. You yeah. use it for whatever you want. Um, but to your point about saying like, you know what, there's black and brown people who totally say, yes, girl, get it. We need you. And then there's others that are like, what are you doing? Why are you here? Mm-hmm. Um, and you having to be mindful mm-hmm. of what it looks like to all of them because they they stand in a space of this is my fight. Mm-hmm. And, you know, it's hard to join a fight where you're not welcome, right? Sure. Yeah. But the voices that are not welcoming you and then others are pulling you. And that in and of itself is a little bit of a struggle. And you have to be strong enough to mm-hmm. stand and to stand still when necessary. Yeah, exactly. And and also it's, it's a constant um, need to self-check, right? Yeah. Like, like, because there, there, I am sure, I don't want to speak this out. What about, what about, how do I want to say this? I want to say that I always need to be aware of where my ego is, right? Mm-hmm. Because there will be times when I am called out um, and I need to pay attention to it, right? Like there will be a time or there are times where a black person is saying, no, you need to sit down. And I might be like, no, I don't want to sit down, but maybe I really do need to sit down. Mm -hmm. And then there are going to be times when um, a person is saying, you know, no, you need to sit down. And I might have to say, no, I think in this particular case, I really do need to speak up. And here's why, right? Like, but it's a a constant self-check that that's not coming out of my ego, that that it has to be coming out of my divine calling, right? Not not the ego. Um, And that's not always easy or fun because a lot of times the ego is at play, yeah. <laughs> you know, and, um, and the ego, there to protect us. yeah, the ego is totally there to protect us. And, and, um, and so, yeah, it's, it's just, it's, it's, um, it's a constant need to self-check for sure. 
But to your point, which I love because it ties in small plug to my book, Selfish, mm-hmm. uh, Cause, Live, Love, and Love Your Way to Joy for all of those of you who are listening and didn't get it yet. So get that and The Good White Racist by Terry Connolly. <laughs> um, yes. Yes. Um, less Thank you. Uh, but at the very end of the book, I talk about the fact that me being able to live fully and live the life that I teach is because I live in a space of and. Mm. And that was my declaration to myself. Yes. Uh, with all of the pain, the trauma, the dysfunction, the learning, the failing, the growing, the, the hurt, the cut, the triumph of it all. My biggest lesson, and of course, there's lots of miniature lessons that stack, you know, when created this awesomeness that I am today, Mm -hmm. right? Um, But it was because if I could take everything away, it was in order for me to live fully, I have to live in a space of and. It's not um, pun intended. It is not a black and white situation in any area of my life, in the way that I love, in the way that I make love. Like, it is not Mm -hmm. a black and white situation. Um, And I think to your point, for right now and in this moment, you have to be in that space of and always. Yep. And totally. everything that you do as well. Mm-hmm. It's so true. And that's such a, that's actually a place of power. And I, I actually, I think that is the power of the divine feminine, to be honest, right? Mm-hmm. It is the ability to hold paradox and complexity and, um, and to not require um, definitive confined boundaries around everything all the time, right? But this ability to say, to be a little bit more fluid um, and to receive, and I, and I really do, like when I coach people and I work with mostly, I work with, in some cases, I work with church leaders and organizational leaders with race issues. And mm-hmm. then I coach individuals um, who are attempting to lean into their, the fullness of, of what they are here to do, right? Yeah. Um, because I do think that we we all get to those pivotal places where we're being called and pulled and lured into uh, our what we're here to to be or into our power, right? Um, but I think that in order to lean into that, there there is a cost. There's always a cost, right? But in order to lean into it, we have to be willing to hold just what you're saying. This this it's not just this one thing. Like mm-hmm. I am not just, um, a, a Jesus follower who writes about race. I'm also a mystic mm-hmm. who has mystical experiences. And, and I'm a, I'm a, I'm all of these things. I'm a woman, I'm a wife, I'm a mom, I'm all of these things. And my power comes from being all of those things. It doesn't come from just one thing. It just does, right. doesn't come just from my ability to write words my words come because it, it, they're drawn from the power of all, all that I am. Right. Yes. Does that make sense? It a thousand percent makes sense to me, but I'm just as woo woo as you. So, you know, you know you're getting, me, you're getting me in my morning writing time. So all of like all of the abstract, like words connections are coming. So. No, it, it a thousand percent resonates with, with all of me intellectually and spiritually. Mm-hmm. And what I hear you saying in a digestible way for those who may not be quite as woo woo as us yes. um, and, you know, ground it to the other dimensions of reality mm-hmm. that we are very aware of. Yes. It is, it is literally the, the many different pieces of you that make all of you Yes, is what I hear you saying. You know, yeah. you just, you're not just saying, oh, I'm powerful. Cause I'm a woman. Oh, I'm just powerful. Cause I'm a writer. It's like, no, actually being a woman writer makes me more powerful than just being either of them separately. Exactly. And then obviously adding on the other gifts that you have together to make yes. what I consider your anointing gift. Thank you. Yes. And I think women in particular tend to, um, society and culture tends to really, um, force us to suppress, um, aspects of ourselves, our boldness, Mm -hmm. our, um, quite quote aggressive, what people like to call aggressive, but assertiveness, our assertiveness, you know, I mean, we're seeing a great example of that on Capitol Hill right now, you know, with C and her very, her absolutely stunning, um, uh, response to the verbal abuse that she experienced uh, from a, uh, from a, another congressperson, mm-hmm. and you know some of the commentary that I've seen is really pointing out the fact that that strong women like terrify toxic masculinity, and th- one of the things that 
I think is so important to understand about toxic masculinity is that it's a, it's a thing, not a person. Yeah. Right. And, and I think that that's also something that we need to kind of understand as, especially for white people who are attempting to deconstruct our whiteness. Mm -hmm. Whiteness is a thing. It's not who, who we are, but it's become so ingrained. We need to start to learn how to separate this, right? right? We need to start to learn how, how do we, how do I go? Okay, wait, that was, that was whiteness. That was the construct. If I have it, if I see a black man in a hoodie and I have a fear response, because that's been programmed into me by media and by lawmakers and by, you know, all of the things. If I'm, if I can practice agency over that and go, Oh, hold on a second. That was just some whiteness that was flying through my brain right there. So if I see a black man in a hoodie, for example, and I have a fear response, right. And that fear response has been programmed into me by media and by culture and by lawmakers and by all the things, right. I can practice agency over that and I can say, oh, hold on a second. That was, that was my whiteness at play, right? That was not, that's not me. That's not the core essence of who I am, but that's whiteness in me. And it can, it could cause me to behave in a way that I don't want to behave. So I want to practice agency over that. I think the same thing is, is true of toxic masculinity. When we talk about toxic, toxic masculinity, we're not saying, you know, men are horrible. We're saying that there are some men who practice a form of masculinity Um, that has been embedded and enculturated into them that they need to start practicing agency over. And I think that's what we saw with Congressman Yoho. And I think what, uh, what AOC is doing so brilliantly is calling out a culture that permits that. Right. Um, And that is, uh, and powerful women um, scare and terrify toxic, toxic masculinity. Um, And I, I think that, that's, I mean, talk about bold moves, man. I was, you took the words out of my mouth. I was like, talk about a bold decision mm-hmm. that will definitely lead to bigger rewards in that case. Cause I know yes. there's a lot of work that continues to need to be done around all of these issues and all of the layers, many of which that you are grounded in mm-hmm. and rooted and making sure that you are not only a key leader, but a key staple and supporter, mm-hmm. which wearing those multiple hats and being keen on when to rotate those hats in and of itself is brilliant. It's yeah. And, and I think that that's one of the things that I hear a lot of white people kind of asking. I think a lot of white people are like, well, just tell me how to not be racist anymore and I'll do it. Like, just tell me what to do. Right. Right. And, and I think that really that that's one of the key issues is that it's always going to be contextual. Our allyship is always going to be contextual depending on who's in the room at any given time. Mm -hmm. Um, And hopefully we can, we can uh, move into a place where, you know, my, my friend Aisha and I, like, we know, we know, like we, so like, if we're in a situation, we don't even need to speak. That's right. And, and I can know what she needs from me, like at any given time. Right. But we've had conversations about it. And, you know, she's had to teach me that because I'm, I'm so Jersey, I'll like go off on somebody, you know, if if, if they're messing with my girl, man, you know, I'm going to, you know, and, but she's had to teach me, Hey, listen, that might not always be the best thing for me. Sometimes the best thing for, for me will be for us to walk away because you might be able to do that, but I'm the one who will bear the brunt of it. Right. Which is really hard for me to to accept because of my feisty Irish right. temper, right? You know, but but that's one of those things that hopefully white people can can um, be in such a rela- a deep relationship with the our black and brown siblings that we can start to recognize what they need with just a look. But until we do, we need to we need to really work and learn um, and and do do what we can and be willing to make mistakes and recognize that we don't that our desire to constantly be perfect at it is a result of internalized capitalism and we need to just yeah. knock that stuff off right um and and really recognize that we're not going to always do this well and yeah. um and and that's got to be okay we have to be willing to make some of those mistakes and hopefully we won't do too much harm while we're making those mistakes and i do think that most most white people really do care about that like we really mm-hmm. do we don't want to do more harm and we don't recognize uh when we do do harm you know so um it's yeah it's messy it's messy which is part of the white privilege right uh, totally it, there's totally a privilege in 
not recognizing that what you thought was good in that Mm -hmm. moment Mm -hmm. is harmful, but still being able to walk away from it. And then that other person or people or group or community has been harmed. And Um, now, and and things are moving so fast in this racial mm -hmm. conversation that even Mm -hmm. now there is, there is talk that the term privilege Mm -hmm. is is coddling white people, right? Like, like, let's just call it what it is. It's racism. Right. Mm -hmm. And, and so things are moving super fast. And even Mm -hmm. I am embedded in this conversation every day I breathe it and even I am having trouble keeping up I'm like okay Mm -hmm. what's what's the next thing like already there are parts of my book that are outdated (laughs) which is (laughs) probably a good thing you know um because it's hopefully meaning progress it's wild on so many levels and you have so much on your plate Mm -hmm. and so many things which is all good because this is the fight that you've been training for you've been in warrior mode for a while and now Mm -hmm. it's here and you had no way of knowing that when your book would be scheduled to drop, there would yeah. be a global pandemic, yeah. global social unrest. Yes. Um, and unfortunately, a leader still in office that we thought would have been excommunicated, for lack of a better term, yes. at least a year prior, probably yes. while you were writing it. You were like, yeah, get out of it. Okay, it's not happening. Huh. Um, with all of that and everything that you have going on, how are you winding down to give mm. yourself permission to pause? That's a great, it's such an important question. And it, it also is contextual. It depends on the day. You know, some days um, I'm doing lots of interviews. And so some days it's just a, a reminder to breathe. It's yeah. like, okay, stop for a second and take a deep breath. You know, um, other times it's, I, I literally put on my to-do list. I separate my to-do list into categories. So like client work, writing, schoolwork, Mm -hmm. because I'm still finishing up seminary, Mm -hmm. you know, and there's a category for personal care. And in that category is meditation and prayer. There's uh, going for a run or, you know, exercise. Um, There's going for a walk. There's sometimes it's a bubble bath. And sometimes self-care means it's, it's kind of the harder questions, like not, not harder, but like I love to, I love my glass of wine, but sometimes self-care means I actually don't drink my glass of wine yes. right? because as much as I want my glass of wine that night, I know that ultimately that glass of wine doesn't make me feel good the next day or for the next three days or whatever. Um, mm-hmm. Cause it, it, it does do that. So sometimes it's um, acts of pause and self-care are what am I going to, it, it's about thinking about what's going to help make me feel good tomorrow, not right just in this moment. So I love that distinction. Um, This is the second major distinction you've made during our conversation (laughs) on air, which I love you for. I love you more for. Um, But especially for those that are out there that may be suffering with any form of addiction Mm. um, in any way, just being mindful, especially when you don't really know that you're addicted, because that's Mm -hmm. for some people, it really is a thing that you just think that you do. It's what you do. It's a part of your routine. And Mm -hmm. you don't, because you can function. Mm -hmm. You don't see it as an addiction at all. And one of the separations that I've made for a lot of people coming from a very dysfunctional background um, and not having my first glass of wine until I was 30, because I was so afraid that the addictions that ran in my family Mm -hmm. were in my blood Mm -hmm. and that I would be susceptible, which I definitely am. I have an addictive personality, hands down, for sure. Mm -hmm. Um, My distinction to keep me sane and safe and not you know, falling down any kind of dark rabbit hole Mm -hmm. was to determine what I wanted versus what I needed. Mm. So if I would come home after 30, obviously, and that was at the beginning of like my kids getting older and graduating with my master's degree and starting my doctorate and doing all the things that I was doing in my thirties, if I said, I need, oh, I need a glass of wine. I would not allow myself to have Mm. it because Mm -hmm. I said I needed it. But mm-hmm. if I'm like kicking it with my husband, we're about to have some boo time mm-hmm. or, you know, I just want time for me and I just want to relax or talk to my girlfriend, my, my sister and I, uh, my best friend since 13, we're beyond blood sisters. Mm-hmm. And if we, we don't necessarily live super, super close together. So if I want to just talk to her and get on the call, be like, all right, we're going to do tea, we're going to do coffee or we might do wine, but we have to want to do it. Yes. Not feel like, oh, girl, I need it mm-hmm. because that's something else. That's me yeah. leaning into something that's actually not fulfilling and rewarding, mm-hmm. um, similar to us leaning away from a fight that mm-hmm. would be fulfilling and rewarding should we boss up 
Mm-hmm. Be bold and brave and walk into it. So I think mm-hmm. that that's something really powerful that you just kind of let in without you even realizing yeah. it. Yeah, that's brilliant. I love that. I, I think that it is a really good distinction between what I want and what I need. And um, and because need is about a relinquishment of power, right? Mm-hmm. You've just given away your power if you're to this thing that you're saying that you absolutely need to have. Yeah. Um, and that's that's a big thing for me, right? Is is yeah. So that's that's brilliant. I love that. Ah, no, nah, look, you started it, girl. You started it. <laughs> so tell everyone how they can connect with you and get access to your writing, your mysticism, mm-hmm. and your coaching. Yeah, the best way to reach me is through my website, carryconnolly.com, www.carryconnolly.com. Everything is on there. You can, you should be able to find my Instagram on there and my my Jersey Girl Jesus Facebook page and all the good things. <laughs> <laughs> Jersey girl, Jesus! Yes. I love it so much for so many reasons. That is awesome. Thank you. You are amazing. I'm honored that you carved out this time. I know we went over and I'm so grateful for it because this was amazing. This is such a great conversation. So much fun. You're, you're like, we always have fun together. We I know, that's true. Every conversation. We really should. <laughs> Thank you so much, Carrie. You are a blessing and a true amazing warrior that I'm grateful to know in this lifetime. Oh, thank you so much. And again, your energy is contagious. Thank you for wrapping me up in it today. Thank you. (laughs) Balance Foley listeners. Was that not amazing? Like, are you kidding me? Okay. Let me reiterate. Go to carryconnolly.com. Make sure you pick up the good white races. Make sure you follow her blog. Make sure you subscribe to her Instagram, which is her favorite place to play. So make sure you are doing all those things because she is someone you want to follow. This is not a, oh, I had a great podcast. That was a good conversation. Keep it moving. This is a get into action conversation. So I want to make sure that you all know to do that so you can continue to grow. If you are new to the Balanced Bully for Ambitious Women in Business and a Few Brave Men podcast, don't you love how long that title is off off air? Uh, Make sure that you subscribe, rate, and share so that the other ambitiously bold and brave men and women out there have access to these valuable balance, love, life, work tools that we are providing to you so you can deal with your imposter syndrome, eliminate it, deal with the burnout, the mundane relationships, all the places that you are playing small, inadequate, and insufficient because the normal is no longer necessary to the conversation that Carrie and I were having earlier. Make sure that you share this with other people and it helps when you put those reviews out there. So make sure you continue to do that so we can continue to get great access. If you have not already picked up Selfish, go get it. It's everywhere. Praise God. Go get Selfish from any of your online bookstores since we're not all back into regular stores yet at the moment that you're hearing this podcast. Go create your balance and create your joy, but remember, do it boldly. Thank you for listening.